threats by North Korea. This is New Day with Chris Cuomo and Allison Camarado. We want to welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world. This is New Day. It is Tuesday, August 29th, 6 o'clock here in New York. Here's our starting line. Tropical Storm Harvey is regaining strength and threatening to make landfall again. America's fourth largest city, Houston, is paralyzed by this catastrophic flooding. You're looking at live pictures right now of storm victims packing the Houston Convention Center, which is way over capacity, giving refuge to thousands more people than anticipated. And thousands more have been rescued, but many are still stranded in rising floodwaters. Rainfall totals now near four feet in the hardest hit areas with more days of rain ahead and the death toll also rising. In just hours, President Trump is going to head to flood-ravaged Texas. The president is going to avoid Houston. He says he wants first responders to stay focused on helping those in need. This isn't the only crisis facing the president. Mr. Trump now weighing his options after North Korea launched a ballistic missile over Japan. After saying just last week that Kim Jong-un respects the U.S. We have it all covered. Let's begin with CNN's Scott McLean live in the suburbs of Houston and the rain is coming and it's coming strong. Scott. Hey, Chris. Well, President Trump will be coming to Texas today, but he will not be coming here to Houston, where it is still very much an active rescue operation, where the floodwaters are still rising. Where we are, they've gotten some 23 inches of rain just in the last 48 hours alone. Other areas have gotten more than 30 inches, and as you can see, there is still a lot more on the way. All 12,000 of Texas National Guards men and women have been activated to help with this response. And some estimates say there could be tens of thousands of people still stranded inside their homes. Now, where we are in northeast Houston, Chris, uh, there's a whole neighborhood back here. You can't see it, obviously, because it's still dark. Uh, but there are hundreds, maybe thousands of houses back there, and they've been pulling people out of that neighborhood all night long. They've been taking them under this underpass before taking them to shelters where they've been given supplies. A lot of them handed out by volunteers. They say they pulled out probably 1,000-plus people just overnight. And this effort, Chris, has relied heavily on volunteers with big trucks, with boats, people who simply wanted to help. I can tell you I spoke to a couple guys who came here from Mississippi. They're fishermen. They brought their boat. They're actually Hurricane Katrina survivors. They said they simply wanted to help and they will be here for the next couple of days or as long as there is a need for them. Scott, solid reporting on that. Some of the guys are part of what's known as the Cajun Navy. Uh, they were born after Katrina. They started helping each other down there, and now they're needed once again. You are looking at live pictures of one of the major shelters down there in Houston. It's the convention center. It is way over capacity already. There are about 9,000 people there. The governor is believing you may have three or four times that that need shelter. CNN's Rosa Flores is live with the breaking details. What do we know? Well, you know, uh, Chris, like you mentioned, we just learned that more than 9,000 people are waking up downtown Houston at that convention center, still grappling with the fact that they lost everything and still processing the trauma of being rescued from rising waters, a lot of them children. Now, I'm a few blocks away. You can see the downtown skyline behind me. You can see a, a pump actually pumping water out of one of the basements here. But I want to turn around quickly because these these are the waters that these people have been rescued from. This is Buffalo Bayou, um, and it's still raging towards the Gulf of Mexico. But back to the evacuees. Capacity at the downtown convention center is 5,000. Right now, 9,000 people are there. Mega church pastor Joel Osteen opening Lakewood Church to uh, being a shelter and also for a donation point. Uh, but, you know, authorities here estimate that many, many more people will be needing shelter. Dallas stepping in. That shelter scheduled to be opening up this morning. And Allison, it continues to rain this morning. Bad news for Houston as it continues to get pummeled. Absolutely, Rosa. Something's got to give there in that uh, makeshift shelter. Thank you for the reporting. We'll check back all morning. Tropical Storm Harvey's torrential rain is shattering records in Texas. At this hour, the storm is regaining strength in the Gulf. And it could dump more rain over Houston and Louisiana. CNN meteorologist Chad Myers has our latest forecast. Tell us what's about to happen, Chad. 
Houston's going to get rain. Beaumont, Port Arthur, also probably all the way over to Louisiana and Mississippi. Maybe even as far west as Mobile today and Pensacola to the east will be some of the heavier bands. But two to four inches of rain on top of Houston last night overnight. South Houston now at 49 inches of rainfall since this started and it's still raining right there. I'm sure we'll get higher numbers today. They usually come in around 8 o'clock in the morning. We'll watch them for you. I'll post them as soon as I get them, but I'm sure some places now are approaching 50 inches. The storm will move this week, finally. It won't really move very much today, pumping a lot of rainfall across parts of southeast Texas, all the way again through about New Orleans, and there you see the heavy rainfall all the way to about Pensacola, Florida. So this now is spreading itself out. That's good news. Spread, spread out all you want. Don't just dump it in Houston, because that's what we've had today. I think Houston gets another two to four inches, even making South Houston's number today, Chris, almost 50 inches, as that what the computer predicted, almost 100 120 hours ago. Mm. So you have all of that saturation and over such an extended period of time, it's just going to ruin those homes and buildings. Chad, we'll check back with you in a little bit. So at this hour, you still have thousands in their homes, many waiting for rescues. Authorities are asking them to hang a white towel outside their home if they need help. Remember, in a lot of these places, you don't have the ability to communicate. There's no power. Cell service is spotty. Joining us now is Ladies Scholl. Emergency workers rescued her and 10 other people, including four children, overnight. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thank, Good morning. thank God you guys are uh, got to safety now. How are you doing? How's everybody? I am so happy to be outside of my house. Uh, we are in the hotel right now, and, you know, happy to, um, or life, to be safe. This. So everybody's healthy, nobody got injured, you know where everyone is, yes? Yes, they are here with me at the hotel. So uh, we got uh, three rooms, so we're staying here together. Were you able to take the things that you needed out of your home? Were you able to take, you know, the most important things with you, or did you have to leave everything behind? I uh, leave everything behind. Uh, we just take uh, maybe one clothes extra. That's what we have. Mm. So how do you feel now that it, you're at the hotel about what comes next? Do you have any plan? We have a little... Uh, anxiety, uh, you know, because we had lost everything. Um, I don't have a plan right now. Um, just, you know, asking to God to help us and uh, to be a strange so we can go through the situation. Um, that's my second time that we lost everything. Um, I did it for Katrina. Now this time on Harvey. So we are... I don't know what's going to happen next, but I, I just try to be calm and um, take something good out of this. Well, you say you've had the, uh, the really bad luck of having to go through this before. You know, this is hurricane season and Katrina marks 12 years uh, today. Yeah. What did you learn yeah. that last time about what it takes to get through something like this and rebuild your life? Yes, and um, like you say, I did it. Um, before, so I, this time it's going to be the same. We're going to, we're going to go through this and we're going to make it. Do you have insurance? Yes, we have friends and they've been calling me, um, to check on me and I'm so thankful, um, with you guys, with uh, CNN and everybody who, you know, is the news and help us, um, to be able to get out from our house and even help our neighbors to get out from, from our house because it was a very deep, very dangerous situation. We, we was, no light, no power, um, no food. So it's not safe for anybody to be, you know, locked inside the house in this situation. We're looking at the pictures of your house now, and it looks like there's water almost up to the roof in some places. How much water was inside the house while you were still there? It was uh, it was reaching about the second floor. Jeez. So the last auction, if it was total, the last auction we had just got to the roof. If we was able to make it for eleven people, I think it was it, it was not possible. Eleven people. How long were you together yes. in that house? 
We wait about 24 hours to get rescue. Wow. Do you have insurance? Do you have ways to recover what was lost? I, um, I do not have it a flood insure for my house. Um, unfortunately, my house is um, uh, abated um, through owner finance, so I don't know what is going to happen. Well, what are you telling yourselves this morning now that you're in the hotel? I'm sure it's just starting to sink in that you're out of harm's way, at least for now. What are you telling yourself? Um, there is hope. And I know um, this is a good moment to everybody come together and work together so we can get out to the situation like we did it before with Katrina. I know we can do it now here in Texas. Well, ladies, I have to tell you, to have the confidence that you have and to be as positive as you are after living through something like that for 24 hours with all those people, you will be an inspiration to many. You will help feed their hope. Thank God you're okay. I wish you well. We will stay in touch with you to make sure uh, that everything's okay in these next few days. Thank you for joining us, and I'm, I'm happy you're safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everything is not finished. I want to tell everybody who went to the same situation that we are going right now is not finished. I'm sure we can do this together. We can overcome this. Amazing Thank things you. are possible when you work together. Be well. We'll yes. stay in touch. Allison. Thank you. Okay, let's find out more about those rescues. The Coast Guard working around the clock in Houston, rescuing thousands of people from the floodwaters. Joining us now is Vice Admiral Carl Schultz. He's the commander of the U.S. Coast Guard Atlantic Area. Admiral Schultz, uh, thank you for being here. We spoke uh, almost exactly 24 hours ago. Tell us what's happened in that time. Good morning, um, Allison. A lot has happened. The uh, Harvey still remains an extremely dangerous storm with catastrophic flooding. The weather reports are indicating, you know, 10 to 20 inches of rain here in the coming days. The storm is sitting, you know, 90 or 100 miles south of Houston and continuing to sock the area, moving very slowly. In the last 24 hours, uh, I believe we've had about 150 additional air rescues, almost 2,000 rescues with our flood punt teams on the water. You know, if you roll those numbers up, I think it's about 3,500 rescues. Um, in the last couple of days for the Coast Guard. Um, we continue to flow assets into the area. I believe right now, I don't have the exact facts on this, but I think we have a helicopter crew in the area that's medevacing a late-term pregnancy um, woman reportedly in the 38th, 39th week of pregnancy, and they're trying to get her to higher-level medical care. Uh, is it true, Admiral, that you're getting 1,000 calls for help per hour? Leave house and that, that it's it's a number in the thousands, a thousand, thousand plus. I don't have the exact fidelity in the call, but yeah, the calls continue to come in a very high volume. Oh my gosh! And so, what condition are these folks in? Once your boats get to them, how do they find people who've been stranded all this time? I mean, we, we find folks by, you know, being through the dispatch, working with the state EOC and the 911 centers, and when our helicopters are out flying on, you know, cases they've been dispatched to, they usually see other folks in distress. The folks on the water, you know, are assigned uh, grids, as are their state and local partners, and, and they work within those grids. I think we've seen a tremendous outpouring of, uh, of what we call Good Samaritans or Texans, helping Texans and uh, the Cajun Navy here in Texas helping out. And I think one important thing is just, to reiterate, that is uh, not work without some danger there. We want to have folks that are experienced in the water. If possible, if they can check in to, uh, to a local staging point, I think that optimizes their effectiveness. What's your biggest concern, Admiral, at this hour? And my biggest concern, I'd say, is twofold. Obviously, the forecast has the storm continuing to sit offshore through today and tomorrow and then slowly start moving northeast. So it's going to continue to dump more water in the area. So this, you know, we have not seen the, uh, the likely maximum extent of the floodings. And we're obviously concerned, like every other first responder, that we don't know where everybody is that's out there. But we are going to continue in the fight and uh, get the folks as we can. We uh, try to triage the calls so we get to those that are in the most immediate distress with the most immediate life set, you know, life-threatening situations, and uh, we just keep at it. Yeah. Admiral Carl Schultz, thank you very much for taking time to update us this morning. We know you have a busy day ahead. Okay, thank you, Allison. Chris. All right, so another big story this morning, a major escalation of nuclear tension. North Korea launching another ballistic missile, this time over Japan. How will the president respond? We have a live report inside North Korea. Next. 
binders. Done. Super cool notebooks. Done. That's mom taking care of business. Energy to get back to doing what you love. And sure, always be you. The U.N. Security Council is going to hold an emergency meeting today in response to North Korea launching a ballistic missile over Japan. President Trump speaking with Japan's prime minister last night. Let's get the very latest from CNN's Will Ripley. Will is the only Western journalist inside North Korea. He's in Pyongyang, the capital, with details. What do we know, Will? We know that more than 12 hours after this missile launch, Chris, North Koreans are still unaware of what has happened. It hasn't been officially announced on state media. And in this, the most uh, isolated country on Earth where people don't have access to things like the Internet, people have been going about their day unaware. We were out on the streets earlier talking with people, and we were told we could not ask about this missile launch specifically because they just don't know yet. But when it is announced, and it will be in the coming hours, North Korea will triumphantly uh, announce it as a major accomplishment by their Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un. The rest of the world looks at him as someone who's escalating the situation on the Korean Peninsula to the point of nuclear war. North Koreans, however, will say that it's actually the United States doing that. They blame the U.S. and specifically President Trump for the military exercises happening right now in South Korea and also for President Trump's fiery rhetoric, which just one week ago today, he seemed to think was working with the North Koreans. Listen. Kim Jong-un I respect the fact that I believe he is starting to respect us. I respect that fact. And maybe, probably not, but maybe something positive can come about. Landed here in Pyongyang, we were quickly told that is not the case. The North Koreans are still furious over President Trump's rhetoric and over the actions of the United States. So what we saw was their most provocative missile launch in years, flying a missile over Japan, over the northern region of Hokkaido, five million people waking up to air raid sirens and emergency messages on their phone telling them to take cover. Just a terrifying way to start the day, even though the missile ended up falling in the Pacific Ocean harmlessly. Also significant here, Chris, uh, the North Koreans launched this missile from the Pyongyang Airport, about 20 miles from where I'm standing in the heart of their capital. Normally they choose remote areas. Perhaps launching from this location near a highly populated city is a sign to the U.S. that they shouldn't think about a preemptive strike because there could be severe humanitarian consequences. So that's the provocative side from North Korea. The Prime Minister of Japan believes that this may be a little bit of a backing off by North Korea because the trajectory of this missile went over Japan and not Guam. Guam, U.S. territory, uh, I guess would be perceived as more provocative. What's your take on that? Well, the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and President Trump had a 40-minute 40 40 minute emergency phone call during the overnight hours, and out of that phone call, uh, Abe said that this is the most grave threat, a really unprecedented threat for Japan, but his foreign minister also indicated that he thinks because North Korea launched this missile on the trajectory it did and not uh, south, that perhaps North Korea may be backing down. They may have calculated here in Pyongyang that by not firing this likely intermediate-range missile toward Guam, which would have likely been a red line for the U.S., that they can they can send a strong message of defiance, they can make this launch different from the others, they can get more attention, but they don't cross that line that could force the United States into military action, which then raises the question, even though the North Koreans say they don't trust Americans, do they want to talk with the United States? And I believe that the answer to that is yes, uh, although the sense I'm getting on the ground here is that the back-channel discussions that occasionally happen in New York between the U.S. and North Korea, uh, unofficial conversations have haven't been going uh, anywhere lately. North Korea certainly wants to come to the diplomatic table, Allison, but they want to do so from a position of strength, not a position of weakness, which is why we see uh, these repeated tests and indications this morning North Korea could be preparing for their sixth nuclear test, new activity spotted at the Pungay-ri nuclear test site. That would certainly send a message and escalate the situation even further. Will, it is so helpful to have you on the ground there for us to bring us all the latest. Obviously, this is developed very quickly and we'll check back with you. Thank you for all that reporting. So in just hours, President Trump will travel to Texas to survey the damage from Hurricane Harvey and get briefed on the relief efforts. This as the president tries to weather his own political storm, defending his controversial pardon of former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio. CNN's Joe Johns is live at the White House with more. What's the latest there, Joe? Good morning, Allison. The president stepping into his role as consoler-in-chief with this trip to Texas. He has been trying to 
strike some unifying notes as this natural disaster continues there with one notable exception. The president took a lot of heat for his controversial pardon of the former Arizona sheriff Joe Arpaio because of the timing of it. It came right as the storm was bearing down on Texas and was seen perhaps as an attempt to try to minimize the media fallout from the pardon. But when the president was asked about it at a news conference just yesterday here at the White House, he said he wasn't trying to bury the news at all and even suggested he might have been trying to maximize it. Listen. Well, a lot of people think it was the right thing to do, John. And actually, uh, in the middle of a hurricane, even though it was a Friday evening, I assume the ratings would be far higher than they would be normally. You know, the hurricane was just starting. Uh, and I put it out that I had pardoned, uh, as we call, as we say, Sheriff Joe. Uh, he's done a great job for the people of Arizona. <laughs> So today it's all about Texas, the president heading out first to Corpus Christi, where he's going to get a briefing then on to Austin to see the Emergency Operations Center there. He'll be traveling with his wife, Melania. Chris and Allison, back to you. Okay, Joe, thank you very much. Let's bring in our panel to discuss all of this. We have CNN political analyst Abby Phillip and chief political writer for the Austin American statesman, Jonathan Tylove. Great to have both of you. So, Abby, President Trump is saying all of the things that Texans would want to hear today. He's saying we're going to get your funding. He's spoken to Congress. He believes the funding for the relief efforts will happen very quickly. He believes they feel the way he does in a bipartisan way. All words of comfort. So what do we expect to see today when the president lands? Well, I think today is really just about um, him showing solidarity with the folks who are there, um, showing support for the first responders who are on the ground. Um, and I think that, it, you know, generally speaking, we're still really in the middle of uh, what is a, a humanitarian disaster and a crisis. So you're not going to see a whole lot of, of politicization of the situation, thankfully. And um, I imagine he'll be there shaking hands, um, uh, saying positive words, and just sort of being a presence. I think it's a little early, frankly. It's Tuesday. Um, people are still ravaged, you know, dealing with floodwaters and being rescued at the moment, um, not too far from where he's going. So in some ways, I think there's a risk here, but, but um, I think the White House is trying to do it in a way that is... is is sort of quiet and unobtrusive, but gives Trump an opportun opportunity to um, to have a presence there. We haven't seen him do things like go to FEMA, for example, in Washington, which presidents often do during disasters, just to kind of give a pep talk. And I imagine that's kind of what he's going to be doing down in Texas. Yeah, I mean, there's always criticism. You go too early, you go too late. Yeah. Um, he's going to be on the ground. Jonathan, uh, Ty Love, uh, before we get into the president, I know you're in Austin, but is your family okay? Is everybody all right with what's been going on with Harvey? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. No, Austin's fine. I mean, there's some flooding in surrounding areas, but uh, no, we're fine here. Hmm. All right. So Thanks the message asking. from the president is I am with you, uh, not just in mind and spirit, but in body. I'm going to be there. What do you think this means? How's right. it being covered on the ground? Well, I think this has the potential to be his, his best moment of his presidency so far because um, he's, he's uh, acting capably and he's coming to show support for the state and he's forged a really strong relationship with Governor Greg Abbott, who I think has also had his finest hour during this hurricane. So barring the unforeseen, which with this president is always lurking, I don't see why this wouldn't be a very good day for him. So, Abby, at the same time that he's confronting this na national uh, crisis, obviously we just had the reporting from Will Ripley in North Korea about what North Korea is doing. What's the feeling in Washington about what's next from Pyongyang? Well, you know, it's interesting because this president has obviously been really focused on North Korea and responding to it. But he's also said some interesting things I, I, that I think you all played not too long ago, um, in which he suggested that whatever the strategy is, is already working, that North Korea is suddenly respecting the United States. I think this, attack, this um, missile launch really proves that to be uh, not not exactly right. And I think it's important for the president to set the right tone here um, and to and also to, to reassure the American people. This is really serious, scary stuff. A missile flying over um, a populous city in Japan, one of our closest allies. 
I think it's important to hear something from this White House that reassures people. Um, at the same time, again, it, it is what seems to be a very difficult and, and somewhat intractable problem. Uh, they're working at it, but there are, have been no break for, breakthroughs at this moment in time. And you'll see the same kind of pressure points, the diplomatic efforts at the UN. Um, you'll, you'll see the White House and the State Department responding um, as they have for the last couple of months. But I'm not sure that we're seeing any change, which is ultimately what President Trump has has promised in this situation. Well, Jonathan, it gets tricky, right? If you're on the ground in Texas dealing with all that despair, do you deal with the international? Do you deal with the political? Do you talk about Joe Arpaio or you just stick to the people who are down there and maybe call out the Osteens and tell them to open up the church and do it sooner? What do you think the play is for the president? Uh, I, I think he's, I mean, my guess is he'll steer away from any politicization of it because this is really something where, um, you know, what, his, his relationship with the governor is such the governor gave the, the federal government an A-plus for what they're doing. And one way to kind of calm the president and maintain his support is to support him. And I think this is a case where the governor's been able to support him without having to go out on a limb and in a way that benefits the state of Texas. I think everyone is clearly focused on the storm here. I, I, you know, who knows what he might say, but I don't think there's any reason why he's going to stray from that. I think, you know, he likes the fact that he's the president in charge of, uh, of recovery and rebuilding of what is you know, maybe the one of the biggest disasters in American history. I think this is something he'll be able to to talk about and 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 suggest that he's, you know, this is one on the on the credit side of the ledger for him. And I think, you know, he's comfortable here. I don't think there's there's some um, political score to settle here. I think here he is in a state where I think he identifies with the state and its leadership, and uh, it should be all good. And I, I don't see him trying to borrow some kind of controversy. I mean, there are some, you know, Sean Hannity and Alex Jones have sought to make the, the mayor, Sylvester Turner, of Houston the heavy for not ordering an evacuation. But... Uh, Turner was very much in, in lockstep with uh, Ed Emmett, who's the Republican county judge. That means the sort of the, the guy in charge of the county. So there's really no controversy there. And while Governor Abbott had said maybe they should evacuate or they should evacuate, as soon as uh, the mayor and the, the county judge said don't do it, he said, well, trust the local officials. So in, in the state, that's not really a big controversy, I don't think. Mm -hmm. The president leaves for Texas exactly two hours from now. Of course, we'll be taking it live. Abby, Jonathan, thank Thank you very much. So round the clock water rescues are taking its toll on one sheriff's deputy. Many more, I'm sure, but he just happened to be caught asleep on the floor. This photo captures so much of how hard all of these folks are working. It's gone viral, and we will speak with this deputy live next. To learn more about how you can help those affected by Harvey, you can go to CNN.com slash impact. Recording. I know John Sununu. I respect him. He'll be a governor, New Hampshire. All right, so here's where Harvey gets a little complicated. The Army Corps of Engineers had opened a couple of the floodgates partially to allow the water to run off instead of, um, you know, risking a major flood of heavily populated areas. But as a result, there are now mandatory evacuation orders in some of the surrounding communities because of the concerns that with more rain and now those floodgates open a little bit, you could have some real catastrophic flooding in those communities. CNN's Polo Sandoval is live in southwest Houston with more. Is that basically the situation as you understand it? Absolutely, Chris. Uh, in fact, yesterday we spent uh, a whole day in one of those neighboring communities in Fort Bend County. The Brazos River there continues to rise there, so some of those mandatory evacuations that you just mentioned, those are in place and they continue to expand. Here in Houston, though, uh, you find this, these kinds of scenes repeating themselves all over the place. Entrances to neighborhoods still flooded out. Believe it or not, this water has gone lower, but that is really the deceiving part of the story. The water level throughout the city goes up, it goes down, much of that having to do with what you just talked a little bit about, uh, which is 
uh, which are those releases from some of those reservoirs as well. Many of that water being released into the bayous. Eventually, those bayous overflow, and they end up in some of these neighborhoods. As a result, more people are having to turn to some of these uh, shelters that are already reaching capacity. And last night, as, as as the sun set, the rain continued to fall. Those floodwaters continued to rise, Allison. And uh, you look at the forecast, we certainly are barely halfway there when it comes to the weather event. As for the humanitarian event, rescuing, housing all these people, Allison, that is something that's very difficult to measure how long that will take. Absolutely, Paul. It's just beginning. Uh, thank you very much. So we have breaking news. These are live pictures inside the Houston Convention Center, and you can see that people are just waking up. There are 9,000 storm victims who will be waking up there this morning. The shelter is almost at double its capacity, but it is still taking people in. Rescuers are working day and night with little sleep, as you can imagine, hence this picture of a Harris County deputy sheriff that has gone viral. Deputy Robert Gerlitz is sleeping against his desk after working around the clock. Deputy Robert Gerlitz joins us now on the phone. Good morning, Deputy. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> Cold and wet. I bet you are. I mean, you've been doing yeoman's duty, as everyone knows, but before we get to all that, can you just tell us the story behind this photo? I'm sorry. Uh, Tell us the story behind great. this photo of why you were sleeping. I mean, it looks like it truly looks as if you basically fell over from exhaustion. Pretty close. Uh, I, I was going for about 21, 22 hours uh, right when I finally got something to eat and sat down. And how excited were you when you woke up and you found out that one of your buddies had taken a picture of you that has now gone viral and been shared 600,000 times? Yeah. A little bit, uh, a little nerve-wracking somewhat, or a little bit surprising. Uh, didn't expect any attention from any of this. And did your, what did your, I mean, what did your colleagues say to you? Was, they, was this in good fun? Did, are, you, are you mad at them, or are you happy that the story's getting out of all that you guys are doing? Well, it was kind of, it was done in fun. It was my sergeant's uh, wife that was there, uh, basically took the picture. Uh, she thought it was kind of funny just the way I colla kind of collapsed on a bag of charcoal. <laughs> Used as a pillow. So, but, but um, Deputy Sheriff, I mean, tell us what your life in the past 24 hours has really been like. I mean, you said that you were working 21 or 22 hours, and what were you doing doing during that time? We were driving a, uh, me and my partner, uh, Andy King, we were driving a, uh, a five-ton high water vehicle and we were down in the Clear Lake area and it was we were pushing that vehicle to its limit several times we uh, we came across a couple of folks inside of cars we were surprised that they were still alive and we were able to get them out of the cars and get them in the back of the, the back of the truck uh, when we were taking this woman to, to the hospital because she was having a heart attack oh my gosh and do you know what the outcome was oh she made it she was fine I mean, listen, Deputy Gerlitz, this is the point. You are out there for 22 hours, and you're finding people in all manner of distress, and you're saving their life, their lives. And so when you show up and people are stranded in their car, just tell us what's that, what's that moment like? Are these people who thought they weren't going to make it? It is. It's, it's, it's to see the look on their faces when we show up, and then it's, it's kind of scary for us because we don't want to find them in the worst kind of way that we could. And it's it's overwhelming to finally see. It's kind of surprising when you sit there holler out, "He's alive!" <laughs> and you see a handprint come up onto the window, and you uh, get him out of the car and get him uh, loaded up. And they're just so thankful that, you, that we should, we were coming down that, that same road. Oh my gosh! Oh, Deputy Sheriff Robert Gerlitz, um Obviously, thank you for all of the good work that you're doing and for sharing this photo. We really appreciate uh, hearing the Herculean effort that is happening behind the scenes there. Thank you and get some rest. Thank you, ma'am. And we will. Chris. Look, an exhaustion is just the pervasive theme. There's too much need, and that's why the calls have gone out to anybody, anybody who can help. Please do so. And that has inspired so much action by people. And we have a story for you that you're going to want to hear. The storm chaser used social media to reunite a man with his dog. People not being able to find their pets. You know, pets are family. And it's become a problem there. But this is a story that has a happy ending. Next. I'm trying to get back to Austin by 2 p.m. At Whole Foods Market. Say 
safety. If the area is flooding, get out of there. You can and will drown. You know what I mean? You have to leave. If there's elderly um, people who can't move, like one of the homes, I helped the elderly lady, and um, she was just sitting on her couch in 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 the living room, and she didn't get up because her cane had floated away. And I'm like, come on, man. We, we carried her. We put her in the boat, and that was really sad. You know, Rachel, so many people don't have flood insurance because they don't live. You, you mentioned an 800-year, you know, flood plans, yeah. places where they ha- that haven't haven't flooded before. Do you know what you're going to do next on on the uh, on the FEMA or the insurance front? Well, we're going to file everything um, like we're expected to do and see what happens. Um, it's it's very very scary. I have two teenage daughters, you know, who just started high school, and I wanted better for them than this, you know. So it's it's very difficult to to think about and to to figure out where we're going to be living. So again, we're fortunate because we do have family, but. So many people don't, and they're in shelters, and they're big, huge buildings, you know, drinking bottled water and eating potato chips, and it's it's horrible to think about. So I, I don't know what the next step is, really, for us, um, but we're, we're amongst the lucky ones. There's no doubt about that. So, Dave, we were looking up statistics. You know, 15% of people in the Houston area have flood insurance, just 15%. That is frightening. Houston is underwater. But despite the desperation you heard there from Rachel, before that you heard the inspiration oh, yeah. and, and how she's, you know, fighting through this, how she's seeing that Texas and spirit in her friends and neighbors, the smiles you saw in the photos there of her children through all this adversity. All right, President Trump heads to Texas today. How's he managing his first natural disaster? test and did he actually use this storm to boost publicity the controversial pardon of former sheriff Joe Arpaio well a lot of people think it was the right thing to do John and actually uh, in the middle of a hurricane even though it was a Friday evening I assume the ratings would be far higher than they would be normally you know the hurricane was just starting it's as effective at hour 24 as at hour one so be wise all take new Zizel. President Trump heads to Texas today to survey the damage and assess relief efforts. The White House has not yet announced where the president will travel, but flight restrictions are set for Austin and Corpus Christi certainly give you a hint. The president says Congress will take, quote, rapid action on disaster relief funding. All right, let's bring back up political economist Greg Valliere. He's chief strategist for Horizon Investments. Uh, Good morning. Let's talk about how well you think the president has done uh, on this on this really important leadership role. And you you mentioned to us that he's got to be very careful about not taking a victory lap because there's still a lot that could go wrong here. I think so far, Christine, he's done a pretty good job. He's been on top of it. He's convened a lot of meetings with people who are coordinating this. But as we wake up this morning and see the extent of the human suffering, people on roofs, people not getting their medication. This is going to go on for a long time, unfortunately. And I think the one thing he has to avoid today is declaring victory. A victory lap would be very inappropriate because we've got such a long way to go. Certainly a great job by Brock Long thus far and FEMA. But to the President's point that I think you're going to see very rapid action from Congress. You're going to get your funding. Given there are 12 legislative days once Congress returns one week from today, given they have to fund the government and raise the debt ceiling, how easy will this be? Well, sadly, Dave, the phrase rapid action by Congress is an oxymoron. Uh, Congress does not move quickly on anything. They're not back for a week. Then it's going to take a few days to put a bill together, probably billions and billions of dollars in aid for hurricane victims. And then the issue is, does it move on its own, or more likely, does it become part of another bill, a debt ceiling increase, an overall budget. People who are worried about not getting a debt ceiling increase may have found an answer, and that is to tie hurricane aid to the bill. It would make it much easier to pass. Well, they they didn't want to tie VA, they didn't want to tie the debt ceiling to the VA funding, but you think this gives them an out, maybe? I really do, Christine. I mean, maybe they could tie it to the overall budget. My sense is the overall budget won't get resolved until December. But they could tie it to the debt ceiling and make a debt ceiling passage virtually certain. I think they're going to go in that direction. All right, so that's not all facing the president. You have the North Korean threat with missiles yeah. launched over Japan yesterday and the Russia investigation stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post. One from the Post talks about Michael Cohen, a close business associate yeah. to Donald Trump. He 
emailing directly to a top lieutenant of Vladimir yep. Putin, Dmitry Peskov, asking about interaction regarding this Trump Tower, Moscow, and the president punting on whether or not Russia is a security threat to the United States. Where does that leave him in all of this? Well, it leaves him still in real trouble. And I think Robert Mueller, the special counsel, will subpoena Michael Cohen, asking him about these emails and what he was trying to do. Uh, Trump yesterday seemed to indicate still a very benign view toward Putin and Russia. So with all these other stories, North Korea, the hurricane, we haven't heard much about Russia. But believe me, that investigation is still very active. What about the pardon of Sheriff Joe Arpaio in uh, yeah. Arizona? Uh, and the president defending that yesterday, you know, saying, in fact, maybe he timed it, saying he did time it for maximum coverage, maximum ratings around the Harvey coverage of the Friday night uh, pardon of a pile. What is, what is the angle here? Well, he got a lot of coverage because he did it on a Friday night and everyone saw in that a, a, a hidden motive. I have a hunch, Christine, that they had planned to release it on Friday night before Harvey was even a hurricane. While it was still forming in the Gulf, I think they had decided, let's dump this on Friday night and it won't get a lot of publicity. So it's absurd to contend that he wanted to get this more attention. Of course he didn't. Well, he certainly wanted the question yesterday, breaking out the names Mark Rich, Susan Rosenberg, yep. Chelsea Manning, yeah. Oscar Lopez Rivera. An interesting comparison, but he was certainly ready for it. Greg Valliere, we appreciate your time this morning. Yeah, okay, Greg, you bet. Greg yeah. says the big, you know, the big uh, X factor out there right now is, frankly, North Korea. No really question that. about that. All right, the catastrophic flooding in South Texas sparks an outpouring of love and support across the sports world. Koi Wire has more in this morning's Bleacher Report. Hey, Koi. Good morning, Christine. Good morning, Dave. Usually a city rallies around its teams, but in this time of need, the teams are reaching out helping hands to help their fans and the people of Houston. In the NBA, Rockets owner Leslie Alexander is donating $4 million to Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner's Hurricane Harvey Relief Fund. The team said the money's intended to help Clutch City come back stronger than ever. In Major League Baseball, Astros owner Jim Crane also donating $4 million to relief efforts. And the MLB Players Association and the league jointly pledged a million dollars to several organizations, including the American Red Cross. How about the NFL? Patriots owner Robert Kraft is going to match the first million dollars donated to the American Red Cross. And the Pats have a special connection to the city of Houston. They've won two of their five Super Bowl titles there. How about the individuals? Like Texan star J.J. Watt. I texted him last night, and he is overwhelmed by the amount of support his fundraising effort has received, including his own $100,000. The fund has raised $1.1 million. People are coming together. People are uh, helping raise each other up. And I think it's not only from the state of Texas, it's from all over the country. And I think that's something special about this country. That's what this country is about, is helping each other when we're down, lifting each other up when we're down. And I think that we're in a time right now where obviously the city of Houston, uh, the state of Texas, especially the southeastern part, is down. And so we need to help them as much as we possibly can. I think it's been unbelievable to see the amount of support that people have shown. JJ received a text from another star, and it became one of the largest donations to his funds. Rocket star Chris Paul, he made a $50,000 donation. If you want to help JJ help the people of Houston, you can visit youcaring.com slash JJ Watt, and you can donate there. And if you want to watch JJ and the Texans, who've been staying in Dallas, they've been practicing at the Cowboys facilities, they've been unable to return home. The teams are scheduled to play in Houston Thursday, but now they'll stay in Dallas and play the game at AT&T mm. Stadium against the Cowboys on Thursday. All right, Clay Wire, nice to see you. Good Thanks, to see Clay. these athletes stepping up. Yeah, Thanks, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, a North Korean missile launch is rattling world markets. Uh, global stocks down around the world. CNN Money Stream has that next. Kim Jong-un, I believe he is starting to respect us. I respect that fact. Well, apparently not. The U.N. Security Council holding an urgent meeting today in response to North Korea launching a missile that flew over Japan. The Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe calling the launch reckless and the most serious and grave threat to his country ever. Will Ripley is the only Western journalist in Pyongyang. He joins us live this morning, 6.26 p.m. there in Pyongyang. Will, what's the latest? 
than 12 hours after this launch, which has just created an uh, uproar around the world, North Koreans still not aware that it has happened because it hasn't been announced on state media yet. We were out on the streets uh, just the, within the past few hours and we're told we couldn't tell people about it because there hasn't been an official announcement. Uh, but I can tell you that officials who are in the know here, uh, they say that this uh, is a justifiable action in their view. They say it is the United States driving the situation on the peninsula to, as they put it, the brink of an explosive nuclear war. And uh, it was certainly a frightening development here in the region as this missile was launched about 20 miles from where I'm standing here in Pyongyang. They launched it from the Pyongyang Sunan Airport, the airport that we flew into over the weekend. This is where diplomats and business people and tourists fly in. North Korea perhaps sending a signal to the United States by launching from near a highly populated area that if the U.S. were to think about a preemptive strike, it could have grave humanitarian consequences if North Korea now has the technical capability to launch missiles from just about anywhere, not just remote areas. That missile flew over Hokkaido in northern Japan. Some five million people were woken up by air raid sirens and frightening messages on their phones telling them to take cover. The uh, trajectory of the missile put it down in the Pacific Ocean harmlessly. It wasn't targeting any population centers, but it certainly does send a message that North Korea has the capability to send this kind of missile that distance, and had they aimed it to the south, it could have come very close to Guam, something North Korea has been threatening as recently as a few weeks ago. In response, an emergency phone call between President Trump and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and South Korea conducting its own ballistic missile drills in response as the tensions in this region continue to escalate. Dave? Kim Jong-un has now launched more missiles this year than his father Kim Jong-il did in his 17 years in power. Will Ripley, live for us in Pyongyang. Thanks. All right, let's get a check on CNN Money Stream this morning where that is top of mind. Global stocks and U.S. futures falling overnight after the North Korean launch of a missile over Japan. European markets down more than a 1%. You can see German markets down almost 2%. In the U.S., you've got the Dow. Dow futures down about 130 points right now. Stocks this year have largely ignored geopolitical events, but the only exception there, North Korea. Uh, while markets are, are not freaking out yet, there is caution on the North Korean situation. Money is flowing into so-called safe havens like gold. Prices there up about seven-tenths of one percent. Flooding right now devastating the Texas Gulf Coast, trying to tally the damage in the early going. It's too soon really to have exact numbers, but the early estimates put